Now, late at night, the rescue convoy is ready to go. The convoy heads out from the Newport facility and turns east and then to the north. The convoy is driving on a road parallel to Hawalwadig Road, and which cuts across the eastern half of the city. Their goal is to set up a staging point on National Street, and then to have part of the convoy, half of which will go to Crash Site 1 and the other half to Crash Site 2. The remainder of the convoy is to await on National Street and to secure the route to the north to the Pakistani-controlled Mogadishu Soccer Stadium. The convoy exits the Newport facility and soon begins to attract Somali fire. Once they were beyond the last Pakistani-controlled checkpoint, the M48 patterns fall back and the Condor APCs take the lead. Now moving west on National Street, the lead Humvees begin to take heavy fire. The barrage forces the drivers away from the column and they end up making a wrong turn to the south. Then, two Condors pass Super 6-4 on its western flank, but the intense fire forces them further to the south. RPGs are fired at both vehicles, and the lead one suffers the loss of its Malaysian driver, while the second is disabled. A perimeter is quickly established around the two Condors by using the vehicles in the nearby buildings for cover. The men involved are part of the 10th Mountain Division's Company A, 2nd Platoon. As the rest of the convoy moves on, Lieutenant Colonel Bill David witnesses the errant condors breaking away from the column. No help would be forthcoming for some time, though the men of the two condors were eventually able to communicate with the convoy. The convoy then stops near the Olympic Hotel, where they create an assembly point. From here, the two separate forces begin to branch out to secure each crash site and the remainder of the convoy begins to secure the route back to the east and north to the Pakistani-controlled soccer stadium, which was their end point. The Rangers and those volunteers who joined with them are forced to dismount from their condors and Humvees when the Pakistani tanks refuse to plow through the barricades near the Olympic Hotel. They are forced to take them apart by hand. Also, the Malaysians are hesitant to venture beyond the assembly point with the remainder of their condors. Company A of the 10th Mountain Division, led by Captain Drew Marowich, pushes out on foot towards the embattled rangers in Delta from the original assault force. Company A is not far from the crash site, though their progress is slow. They also had an edge over their opponents, for this time they could see into the darkness and find their enemies. Their vehicles are to come up once they reach the crash site. About an hour later, Company A has fought through numerous obstacles and Somali sniper fire. They are within only a few hundred yards from Super 6-1. Company A has linked up with Captain Steele of the Rangers and has reached the D Ranger and Delta perimeter near Super 6-1. Captain Steele attempts to assert control here but is denied by a senior officer. The combined QRF and TFR force is able to expand its perimeter and then to encircle Super 6-1. There are over a hundred men at the crash site at this time. They then begin the process of extricating Chief Warren Officer Wolcott from the wrecked Black Hawk. Also, the expanded security allows for the forces to consolidate, for medics to continue working, and for food, water, and supplies to be distributed to the wary assaulters. The Americans had brought saws, but the Black Hawk's Kevlar layer quickly wore down the blade at which point they then tried tearing open the helicopter with chains in their vehicles. Eventually, Chief Warrant Officer Wolcott's body is pulled free. The many wounded or killed are then loaded into the vehicles. By this time, soldiers from the 10th Mountain Division, Company C, are nearing Super 6-4. They are also quite near to the soldiers of the two deviated Condors. About 17 minutes later, the U.S. forces have regained control of Super 6-4. Its crew, Chief Warrant Officer Durant and the others, along with Delta snipers Gordon and Shugart, are gone, though there are signs of struggle. There are blood trails, scraps of clothing, and numerous spent ammo casings at the scene. The Delta team, led by Sergeant Mace Junis, that was attached to Company C at this point, then uses thermite grenades to destroy the sensitive equipment and materials on the downed Blackhawk Super 6-4. Thermite has been used extensively since World War II and most noticeably against artillery. Compared to a regular grenade, thermite grenades and charges are relatively silent. They accomplish their work through incredibly high heat, upwards of 2500 
degrees Celsius or 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is easily hot enough to weld, burn, or destroy most materials. It is not explosive and is commonly used to weld rail ties together. Company C, at the wreck of Super 64, is under constant fire as Company C at the wreck of Super 64 is under constant fire and is blocked by Somali forces from pushing down towards the stranded members of 2nd Platoon and their ruined condors. Under the protection of AH-1s and AH-6 gunships, 2nd Platoon is able to reunite with Company C. At one point, two buildings are destroyed by the gunships in order to clear out Somali snipers and fighters. Chief Warrant Officer Wolcott's body is pulled from Super 61, and then the Black Hawk is thermited and destroyed in its entirety. Also, at this point, the number of critically wounded is between 40 and 50. Ready to move out, all remaining forces remount into the Humvees and Condors. However, for about 15 men, there is not enough room. They are from 1st Lieutenant Perino's Ranger Chalk and some from Company A of the 10th Mountain Division. The men are to jog alongside the convoy and to use the vehicles as shields on their return to the Pakistani-controlled stadium to the northwest. The convoy is taking and returning fire all along its length. The M48s are shooting at buildings while the Little Birds and Cobras continue to provide air support. As it moves to go to the soccer stadium, the convoy begins to break into sections as the drivers speed up or slow down through different intersections, and areas depending on the amount of fire that they are taking. After some six blocks, the group on foot attempts to flag down one of the last M113 APCs. They are ignored until one of the Deltas levels his rifle at the vehicle. This march that was conducted by them is known as Mogadishu Mile. They are then able to return to the base. Also, some of the vehicles return along the convoy's approach route and arrive at the airfield and then the ranger base. It takes some time for everyone to be accounted for. The wounded begin to receive treatment and others are flown back to the ranger base for surgeries. The initial estimation of a one-hour mission had in fact taken 14. After the Battle of the Black Sea, Task Force Ranger conducted no further raids. The battle would later be called in Somali, Ma'alinti Rangers. The Day of the Rangers. By the time the battle had ended, the U.S. had suffered 13 deaths, 6 were missing, 73 were wounded, and 26 Somalis had been captured. Among them were Colonel Abdi Hassan Awali and Omar Salad and 24 other Somali National Army members. The Malaysians had a single death and 7 casualties. The Pakistanis lost one soldier and had two other injured. The numbers for the Somali forces are harder to pin down, but an estimation of 500 plus killed in action and over a thousand casualties is reasonable. These numbers would later inflate somewhat as the more critically wounded died from a lack of available medical care. Adid's forces had however managed to take down two Black Hawk helicopters, damage other helos and many other vehicles. Also. They did capture Chief Warrant Officer Durant when his Black Hawk Super 64 was overrun and the Delta snipers that were defending it were killed. Major General Garrison went on to serve in the U.S. Army until 1996. He retired the day after Muhammad Farrar Adid died. In the aftermath of the battle, General Garrison took responsibility for what happened in a letter outlining his actions and opinions to President Clinton. The two Delta snipers who volunteered to defend Super 64 would later be awarded the Medal of Honor. The pilot of Super 61, Chief Warrant Officer Clifton Elvis P. Wolcott, was retrieved from the wreckage of his Black Hawk, and he would later be awarded for his valor as well. Chief Warrant Officer Michael Durant spent 11 days in the custody of Adid's men and under the care of Farimbi Hassan, the propaganda minister to Mohammed Farrar Adid. He would later be given back unconditionally to the U.S. via the Red Cross. By March 31, 1994, America withdrew from Somalia. The American public no longer held much interest in trying to further assist war-torn Somalia. U.S. forces conducted themselves bravely during their time in Somalia, though they faced many obstacles. They had to contend with asymmetric battlefields, foes that could disappear into the local and sometimes tolerant populace, tribal conflicts, and a loosely defined mission. 
Adid would remain active in Somalia for another three years. Eventually, he would declare himself president before being taken down by his former allies, Ali Mahdi Muhammad and Osman Ali Atto. The men that were captured during the October 3 raid were held in a jail near Kismayo but would later be released. The Somali strategic victory evokes the past experiences of U.S. forces in Vietnam and the more recent ones in Iraq and Afghanistan. Somalia still faces many problems today. Illiteracy, poverty, hunger, and the trafficking of humans, narcotics, and weapons, piracy, and the lack of a strong, stable, and lawful government have made it one of the most difficult places to live on Earth. In creating this series, I used a number of different sources. Here are the major ones that I drew upon for the history and account of the Battle of the Black Sea. As with any project, I am sure that I have missed or gotten some things wrong. I have attempted to verify everything that I have put pen to paper to, and when a discrepancy has occurred, I have tried to resolve it to the best of my ability. If you find any errors, misrepresentations, oversights, or anything else you'd like to comment on, please do so in the comment section below. This is a first attempt at a project like this for me, and of this scale and magnitude. It has been a pleasure learning about the trials and triumphs of those who fought proudly on the streets of Mogadishu. As with all things, there are many points of view and I hope that I have portrayed the events in their proper light. Also, if you have any suggestions or requests for future battle reports, please let me know. I would also like to extend a very special thank you to the men and women serving in the armed forces.